Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to today's Smart Bear Academy training. Today, we are covering Test Left 101, and we're really excited that you are joining us. My name is Drew Morgan. I'm on the customer education team. Um, and today, we're going to be learning from Param, a technical engineer here at Smart Bear. As you said, my name is Param Chopra. I'm one of the sales engineers here at the U.S. office at Smart Bear. And uh, tell me a little about us, if you, if you haven't, or if you're not aware of what we can fully do, but you know, we're, we're a rapidly growing business uh, based out of Boston, Massachusetts. We also have a, a sales office in Galway and uh, among a number of different offices around the globe in the U.S., Coconut Creek, uh, as well as Memphis, as well as you know, in Sweden, Russia, things like that. And, you know, we've grown to about, you know, six and a half million users plus of our products spanning, you know, pretty much every country out there. No, we're pretty much in every vertical as well, right? Because if you need to test your software, uh, you could definitely use some of our products. We've been around now for almost 10 years and you know, we're certainly, I think, you know, being a driver at open source, uh, of open source usage with Swagger and Soap UI has only helped uh, get our name out there. Uh, but you know, not only do we do Soap UI and Swagger, but if you see in our product list on uh, the next slide, uh, we actually work in the front end spectrum as well, which is kind of what we'll be talking about today with Tesla. And so you can see on the slide um, that we'll be able to cover all parts of the SDLC uh, in terms of what tools we can provide for uh, your application, uh, from all from beginning from the design portion or entry level portion of your process. You know, Code Collaborate is a great tool for your devs to do peer review on their code as well as you know, share documents, plan, et cetera. Swagger Hub is a great way to start uh, designing your, your REST APIs, get that Swagger definition. And then, of course, I'm sure a lot of you have heard of SOAP UI, where we have a SOAP UI Pro version. I think specifically it's different in that allows you to uh, data drive uh, your SOAP tests. And you have Test Complete as well, our, our flagship automation product on that side of the business, front end side. And then, of course, you know, we can expand testing with cross visor testing or crap service fee in the back end to virtualize some APIs. We can load test our tools in the back end or front end, and we have some performance monitoring with alert site. Now you can see in the middle there, we have QA complete. Uh, that's been our traditional test management tool. It's gonna allow you to manage all of your testing activity. Not only for smart bear tools like test complete, test left, SOAP UI, uh, but also let's say for some of your Selenium tests as well. And finally, we recently acquired HIP test, uh, a behavior driven development and collaboration tool. The idea is that, and it's gonna actually fit very similar with this test left presentation today, but as companies and teams want to shift left and be more agile in the development and testing process, you know, they could perhaps leverage the, the philosophy of behavior-driven development to help them do so. You know, the idea is to uh, essentially get everyone on the same page earlier in the process and, and incrementally iterate on your solution versus building one version of it and then going back and making major changes and bogging that process down, right? And so HipTest is a great tool to allow you to not only do BDD a little bit easier, but it's gonna you know, help you also test continuously as well, perhaps generate some living documentation. Again, helping that shift up process. So I think might touch upon hip test a little bit at the end there just because we recently purchased it. Now, last slide here, uh, or actually before I go to the last slide, um, <laughs> at the bottom, I just wanna note out that um, SmartBerry, I think we definitely pride ourselves on working with other tool sets out there, especially open source tools, like a Jenkins, GitHub, uh, Selenium, uh, as well as, you know, other tools out there like Visual Studio or Jira. The idea is that, you know, as you work with us, we want you to have the best setup to test your application uh, and, and products uh, for your scenario, right? We're not simply saying buy one wholesale solution. So we can certainly, you know, not only plug and play within our own tool set, but uh, along with other tools out there that are in popular use today as well. Now, now that I've given you all of that uh, great marketing stuff on and smart bear let's go ahead and talk about the product so i'm sure that's more more of interest so today with test left uh what i'm going to cover in the 101 is the general problem test left solves and why we think it'll be useful and then we'll talk about using test left with behavior driven development and what i'll quickly say is that you know test left uh, is you know bdd agnostic and bdd is test left agnostic right but they definitely kind of fit together pretty well not only in terms of story, right, in the shift left idea, but also you know, in terms of actual implementation as well. We'll take a look at that 
Uh, from there, we'll take a look at recognizing objects with the uh, test set object spy and, and what exact features we have with that, uh, and maybe what some settings you might want to choose in that in that area. And then finally, we'll go ahead and build an application model and walk through the process of that, perhaps what you can do with the application model. We'll also spend a little bit of time in the beginning after we cover this point A here. We'll we'll quickly just maybe talk about or maybe after B probably, after we cover the BD example, I'll talk a little bit about what you might want to do to you know, get SpecFlow or Cucumber, let's say, installed uh, in your you know, Visual Studio or Java IDE instance uh, to help you uh, get started. But uh, that's the agenda today. Uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, do feel free to ask questions panel. Drew will be checking that uh, pretty periodically, maybe letting me know uh, that we want to stop. I'll also probably check it after each major point as well. Uh, and before we get started, we have two demos for this for this product, one in C Sharp in Visual Studio and one in Java. So, you know, I'm going to take a hunch and say Java is the more popular one, but there's about only 18 of you. So if you guys could raise your hand if you want C Sharp, that'd be great. We'll do a little counting here. All right, we got four. Let's see what else. Who else? Are you saying it four out of 18? Nobody else? All right, unfortunately, I, I have to uh, disappoint the four, now three C-sharp users uh, out there. Uh, the nice thing is the tool is going to work the same way. I can certainly, you know, speak about that, but we'll, we'll go ahead and use uh, IntelliJ and Java as the basis for our demo today. So let me go ahead and uh, quickly share my screen here, load up my IDE. Give me one second. So first thing I want to show you guys, let's see if you can see our screen. All right. So uh, these are not smart pair backed officially. This is all purely what I did to get started on this uh, when I learned these processes. Uh, three things that I found helpful. One, for, uh, for you C-sharp users out there, um, oh, what's going on here? Um, let's see. There it is. Um, so back to what I was talking about. Um, for your C-sharp users out there, for BDD, you might want to use a tool called SpecFlow. Um, and all I did was I just Googled SpecFlow tutorial and I found this from their site. It's pretty straightforward and a nice thing is it has these nice graphics showing you exactly what you need to do in, in your Visual Studio environment. So I think it's pretty straightforward to get set up and you'll see why you might want to use this with Tesla, let's say down the line. Now for your Java users out there, uh, Cucumber, I think, is the other equivalent. Uh, I think Cucumber might own SpecFlow as well, I, although I'm not so sure about that. But as long as you have a JDK and JRE and you download a Cucumber, you should be able to use it to define uh, Kirkin feature files and then implement those files in a code-oriented format. And you can use Cucumber with any kind of Java framework, uh, JInit, TestNG, anything like that. And then what I recommend with Java in general is to also use Maven if you're not. I think Maven is a great way to package all the files you need for your project together. And it's, it's, it's all open source, relatively uh, free to download. And building a Maven project, right, once you download it, it just, you know, they'll give you the command line arguments you need to build. And then you can take that POM XML file and you can go ahead and, you know, fill it out with the dependencies and, and necessary artifacts that you need. So I just want to quickly point that out, but now that we've killed some time and gotten my IDE, let's dive into test up demonstration. So, Here's my Maven project file uh, for my Java project. Uh, you know, I'm using some you know, solver.com test left dependency, right? I'm using my Cucumber and JUnit. I got Java you know, 1.8 here. So I want to make sure you have everything here set up. Because again, this is the file that will be running, let's say, upon test time. All right. So let's get into the, what we think test stuff solves in terms of a problem. What we see with a lot of web and desktop uh, developers and testers is that they spend a lot of extra time in testing their applications. Not only in the short term in terms of the process of building test cases or frameworks, uh, test their application, but also in maintaining that framework and building scalable tests for the future, right? And we see this problem, you know, kind of exhibit in a, in a couple of ways. I, I think uh, one way we've seen uh, amongst our users is that, or prospects we talk to, 
is that let's say you're using Selenium for web testing, uh, right? You don't have time to build out perhaps an object model, right? That or a page application model that represents your application in, in, with a series of classes and methods, right? That takes a lot of effort. So they're writing a lot of quick tests, you know, building a lot of quick local drivers, and they're making their tests a lot longer than they need to be and a lot more brittle, right? So that might be one way to solve that short-term cost, but then you're, you're not helping yourself in the long-term, right? And if your source code refactors, it's a lot of extra editing or frankly, script you writing you're gonna have to do. And that's gonna bog down your testing time. The flip side we've seen with some larger teams is that you know, when they wanna get the developers involved, they've actually said, okay, we're gonna build out an entire application uh, page model in, in Selenium or, or an open source or, or you know, whatever code base they're working out of. And so they spend a lot of great time doing that. And okay, from there, building tests is more straightforward, but now you're spending a lot of time just initially building out your framework, not even testing anything. And then again, if your source code changes, right, you have to build that framework from scratch again. And so we see a couple of these issues really bogging down testing time where testers and developers are spending more time in maintaining or building out frameworks than they are in actually testing their application. And so that's where test left comes in. The idea is to really reduce that time on, on both ends. Uh, to not only help you save time in the micro, right, and how you're creating tests uh, initially, but also how you edit them and then let's say build tests in the future as well. So we'll walk you through some of those features. So at the end of the day, we're trying to save you time and, and help you build uh, a more maintainable code base for your testing architecture. And then from there, the other big benefit I think of test left is the idea of collaboration, which is why we'll dive into B2D next. But the idea of test left is, at least from what we've heard when we launched a beta, you know, users, they want to get the development teams involved. They want to be a little more agile, a little more iterative in their process, right? Uh, yeah. And do things in shorter cycles. And so, you know, the developers at least start writing unit tests perhaps, right? Or, or get in that game. And they also perhaps want to reuse the work their testers have done. Uh, we've seen this with, you know, if any of you are test complete customers, right? This is where we've also seen that, where they're using, QA's using test complete, developers are not, right? And there's a miscommunication or, or uh, a unclear connection, right, between the efforts of what dev does, let's say in a unit testing uh, efforts, and what QA does, right? Maybe stuff is not being reused. Maybe, you know, the source code changes and it's not being properly communicated. So obviously teams want to get to a point where everyone's on the same page earlier and more iteratively. And so a tool like TestLuff can help that because not only does it allow developers to get into the game, right, of, of, of automation, right in the ID of their choice, but it's also to allow us to bridge that gap between QA and development especially when you take a look at the image of development as that overarching process behind it. And again, you don't have to use BDD and test stuff together. We're, we're, we simply really like this use case. We think it's a, it's a useful way to present test left along with the useful way to use test left, but at the same time, um, you know, being agile and, and, and meeting that growing need for getting software out the door even faster, right? We certainly believe that some of these practices can aid in doing so. So now I've talked about that problem we're gonna solve, let's talk about BDD for a quick second. So I have some of these feature files here and let's see who in the audience knows. Uh, so let me ask you, raise your hand if you know what BDD is. You've heard of it, you know what it stands for. All right, got a couple of you, four, three, four of you all. Now, what about out of those people, how many of you have ever written a Gherkin feature file? All right, got about two of you. Okay, so not a lot of you have seen BDD out of the 19 or 20 attendees on this call. So let me be very brief about it and we'll get right to test left. So behavior-driven development, the philosophy, right? Let's take a break from the tool for a second. It's the idea of collaboration, working in conjunction earlier in your process, along with being more than iterative in your process. The other idea is really that collaboration piece. And specifically, it's about defining consistent language that describes the terms of your application or test, its components, your requirements, right? Using consistent business language, right? So that everyone well, from a business analyst to a tester to a developer to a PO can be on the same page, right? Because 
in the past you could work in silo teams, but to be more agile, you know, to, to get stuff at the door faster, you, you have to work together more, right? So the idea was to say, okay, let's build a consistent framework, consistent language set, right, that you could use to communicate. So that's all BDD is at a high level. And, and maybe I'm, you know, I'm missing something there, some other specific things with BDD. I'm no BDD expert by any means, but at the same time, forget any tools or, or, or anything like that. It's the whole idea, right? So you could do BDD with napkins if you wanted to. All you got in a room and, you know, wrote, on napkins, what my requirements were in a language all understood, that's BDD. But more specifically, with, with what you see in front of you, people behind BDD, a very popular way to create that common language set was to use something called Gherkin. And again, you don't have to use Gherkin to do BDD, because again, it's, it's more about just collaboration, right? But how it's implemented in a popular sense today is to use Gherkin language. The key aspects of Gherkin are using these given when and then keyword statements and then maybe ands to conjoin things and the actual text after those words doesn't matter that's all up to you but generally they'll use given when and then to describe the state of something right in a consistent manner and so you know you could say given some preconditions when some actions happen then you have a result right that's the general structure of a gherkin file you will also perhaps have you know a feature description above it right uh, maybe a scenario outline title as well. Now, the other idea of Gherkin is to write language at a business level, at a higher level, uh, versus at a very low technical level, because that way everyone can understand what's happening. And that's going to vary, right? What high level or level is for your team, it's going to vary across your teams. The idea is that you want to write in the, you, you want to avoid writing in a low level where not everyone's going to understand what's happening, because then it's not going to be useful. So we use BDD to create business logic to describe the state of what we want our application to do. So we don't necessarily need to use it to describe the how, or, uh, right? Because that's, that's redundant abstraction, but the what, the state of your application, the state of my requirement, what should it do? How should it act? What's the behavior? That's where you define these files. So for example, today we're taking a look at some web orders application, right? We're adding an order. Make sure that adding a new order causes appropriate changes in the UI. So that's my requirement. And the scenario is given I've launched the orders application and I've logged in, when I add the order new parameters and I should see the new order in the list of orders. Now, this is not the best example for high level business logic, but it's like in between, right? Because I'm not telling you how to launch orders application. I'm not telling you, uh, you know, what order to enter those parameters in, et cetera. But it generally describes if I enter my order with these conditions, I should see a new order on the list. So now what I can do in this case, a cucumber against this file, or perhaps a spec flow with C sharp, is that I can generate step definitions for this BDD feature file. So the other idea of BDD in terms of Gherkin is not only to work together collaboratively to create this common language, but to implement that language, right? And that's where we'll see test thought come in. But the idea now uh, between these BDD tools in the market, including our own hip test, is that we can take your scenarios and convert it to executable code, essentially convert it to a framework, which is very easy for you to then go ahead and implement in an organized fashion. And not only is that gonna allow you to, again, be more organized in your efforts and allow, again, a greater range of users to interact with your automation through these BDD files, but it's also gonna allow you to reuse these tests in a modular fashion as well. So we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I'm going to go quickly show you the step definition and we'll quickly stop for questions before we dive into test stuff itself. So the step definition, all step definition is, is a method or a function that is tagged with one of these statements. So that means when one of these statements gets run, right, given I've launched the orders application, it's going to go and trigger a method to go ahead and execute. So when this gets triggered, zoom in there this method gets called. So you can see, right, given I've launched your orders application, that's its, its annotation from Gherkin right there. Uh, it's a, sorry, it's a Cucumber annotation. And the nice thing about Cucumber Spec flow is that it's gonna create the method signature, the curly braces, it's gonna create all that for you. So all you have to do is just throw the code in, the actual actions, right? And so that's what an open source BDD tool is gonna do for you. It's gonna take those BDD statements, right, and be as high level as you want, 
and convert them into methods for you to go ahead and implement, right? And so you have a lot of freedom here in how you define what your VD statements say, but the idea is that it allows you to be very modular in your testing process, it allows you to build your test cases in smaller bite-sized components, especially components you can reuse. And that's important, right? Because this step, given I've launched your orders application, I'm using in three different feature files, you know, adding an order, deleting an order, deleting all orders. So whenever I call this one statement, even if I call it from three different tests, they all get the same implementation, right? So now, okay, if I have a consistent implementation of some phrases, then I can go ahead and reuse those phrases in other scenarios and then run them that way. So that's the power of BDD, right? It's going to allow us to have that reuse some organization. And then I can have a business analyst in effect, right? Execute some of these tests because they only have to run a Birkin file, not necessarily the code behind it. Now, one thing I will say before I dive into Tesla is that, is that the idea is not to say, okay, I'm a bad business analyst will write Gherkin and then it's going to pass off my developer for him to implement and pass it off again. You can do that, but then, you know, maybe you're just adding more work for yourself, right? The point is to collaborate together. So to really take advantage of this, it's to really get in the same room and flesh out your requirements so that developer isn't building something that is different than what, let's say, the BA uh, put in the requirement, right? Because people, you know, definitely interpret things differently. Here, you can kind of get rid of that amb ambiguity by working together and working, again, consistent language base. All right, I'll, I'll stop evangelizing on B2D for a second. Let me check our questions because we've got some chat. Oh, no, it's just our Academy link. So do we have any questions? No, we don't. So uh, uh, please do feel free to ask some questions at this point in time about what I spoke on BDD, anything else? Uh, and then in about 20 seconds, I'm going to start talking about exactly how we filled up these methods um, with functionality from Tesla. All right. So we talked a little bit about behavior driven development and how we can take these, these requirement files, these feature files you write and translate them into code. But how do we actually get the code that fills up these methods? For example, the second statement here, I've logged in using a username and password. You can see that even if I wasn't that technical, right? I could still probably, even without the BDD statement, understand what's happening here, right? We're setting text on some username, then on a password, and we're clicking on a login button, looks like. It looks like we're also making sure that some, some uh, table is visible or some orders page is visible after this operation. So this is pretty nice, right? I mean, there's just a nice object oriented lines of code. How do I get this clean? Because I know from talking earlier, right? It's hard to get this using open source. Either you're building out the model behind these objects beforehand, spending all that time doing that and then implementing, or you're writing code that's not this neat, right? You're writing code that perhaps is a lot, a lot more script heavy, a lot of, local drivers, a lot of web pattern matches, right? Things that are harder to maintain and fix. So that's something that we probably want to avoid. So how do we get something that is nice and object oriented like this? Well, that's going to bring us to using test left UI spy to help us not only identify our objects under test, but also get code pieces as well. So we have one question from Q and a, um, um, from, uh, Venkatesh, uh, can we use data from Excel sheets in BDD? Yes, you can. Uh, so, ah, well, so yes and no. Cucumber and Specful, I believe, don't, the way you would do data-driven testing would be through a Gherkin table. What I'd recommend doing if you want to use an Excel sheet is Tesla can actually plug in and, and take data from any 32-bit or 64-bit ODBC driver source like an Excel sheet. So I'd recommend data driving from that side. Uh, but I'm not so sure if, if Cucumber or Respectful take Excel sheet. I'll look that up, but I, my, my guess would be no. All right. Took care of that. All right. Thank you for that question. All right. So as I was saying, how do we get to these nice one lines of code? Let's take a look at our UI spy. So let's see. We're going to take our application here. Launch it up in a browser. There it is. And this is a simple web orders application. It's 
It's really not that fancy, just adding in very uh, random orders, as you can see here. And there's three pages to this application. All my orders, adding an order, and then of course the login screen, right? And now let's say if I'm testing this application, I wanna go ahead and interact with the username, right? Okay, I wanna set some text there to help log in. If I'm using an open source tool like Selenium, I have to perhaps inspect the element or have a good understanding of the source code to know exactly what that object is called and where it's located in the object hierarchy in order to refer to it with some you know, pattern matching or whatnot. And I have to do it all from scratch. But with test left, your developer or tester doesn't have to have any idea of the source code beforehand because we can get that information live using our UI spot. Now, uh, right now, I can launch the UI spot from Visual Studio. It actually embeds directly in Visual Studio. I can launch it from a clip, sorry, from a IntelliJ here. And in general, it's going to work with any other IDE you want, right? So if I was in like, you know, work in Sublime or something, right? Or anything like that, I could go ahead and paste Tesla code into that editor as well. So it doesn't really matter what source code editor you use, as long as you can compile your project, right? Uh, the key is, is that I can just run it as a standalone program. And that's what basically this will do right now when I go to tools and launch test up UI spy. So at first glance, this is simply an object repository. Uh, for those who are using test complete, it's the same exact thing that test complete has. It's showing you every single application and control running in windows memory, running in a DOM layer of your machine. And so we're looking past the CSS layer for your web elements, past location, past the browser layer, all of that. We're looking at really the lowest, elements possible uh, so we can see and when we extract these elements we look for the most unique uh, sub properties to you know identify them by right allowing you to have to refactor less in general so you know as you can see I can click my process you can maybe see a, an image of exactly what test up the scene right you can also see all this nice piece of data available for me to use uh, metadata methods I can filter by them to search for them, right? So this, just, just this by itself is pretty useful because I want, you can give your application to a developer and they can you know, identify it with this tool versus having to know anything by uh, documentation or inspecting elements or anything like that. But here's where the real cool part of the UI spot comes in. I still want to interact and get my username. I don't have to find it in my Firefox process, right? That's going to be annoying. So let me take my object UI spy. I can easily identify the box that I want to use. Let go. Tesla will show me where it's located, right? And again, what I can go ahead and do to it or validate against it. Then from there, I can right click that and copy the identification of this username. And then wherever I'm defining my code, right? So quickly to, on that point, right? Um, maybe what we'll do is we'll create a new class. It's called sample for now. And whenever you run uh, test left, I don't know, code, I was gonna say stuff, that doesn't sound good, code, uh, you wanna have all of our libraries available in that file. And maybe you wanna maybe also perhaps make sure scope is also good as well, right? So I'll go ahead and do that. And then back to the UI spy, right? And pretend that this is a function, not a class right now. This is just for the sake of example, right? But if I go ahead and copy the identification, whatever method I'm going to go ahead and use this username in, well, control V. That's it. Get the username just like that. Now, what's happening here, very quickly, is Tesla is generating a new local driver for me to use to generate a quick instance of any control living on my machine, right? Um, you can also have an inherited class that instantiates your driver beforehand You can attach to that driver process. I'll show you how to do that in just a second. But for now, it's gonna generate this local driver and we're using uh, a pattern match against that driver, right? By its find method to go ahead and find my control. We start at the browser layer with an object identifier Firefox then it goes and looks for a web page uh, that has a URL property of, of the address. Then it looks for a web element um, that, uh, of an object type form, ID string ASP net form, and finally a text edit object, object type text box. So from there, 
that's it. I've gotten my, my control. So now all I have to do is write what? Text box dot click, right? Or, you know, whoops, not text bix. Uh, uh, or, you know, text box dot set text. So as you can see, it's gonna be far quicker for me to get to my test actions now using this kind of method of, of object discovery than it would be doing from scratch, right? And this is where we see a major problem with our customers. This, just identifying their object takes so much extra work to make sure you're identifying the proper element, right? You don't know maybe uh, which one to identify by. You don't know which one is unique necessarily, right? Whereas we're gonna pull out, in general, the most unique identifiers we find based on our engine. And if you decide that you wanna change those identifiers around, right? You wanna wildcard the object type is it's dynamic. You want to add your own custom identifiers. Again, that UI spy is available for you. It's got all the information. You can go ahead and do so. So we can give you the, the code. You can beef it up if you want. But as you can see, this is the text box I want. I can go ahead and interact with it right away, saving me that initial time in identifying my objects and then creating code for my objects, right? It's a lot quicker to write these single line statements of click, set text, you know, hover versus writing out a whole pattern match from scratch, right? So that's the first thing we're gonna save you time in, just initial code creation, initial test creation. So let's see, there's no questions, but again, feel free to ask any questions about how this is done. But I'm gonna quickly talk about some other options you have for this code. The UI spy itself, um, let's go down here, is, let's see. What do I wanna talk about? Um, all right, so the UI spy, you have a couple options with the UI spy. Uh, right now it's outputting to Java because that's where I launched from a Java IDE, but I can change the code to vb.net or C sharp as well, right? Then you can either have the instance that's created, create a new local driver directly or you could attach it to the current process running in your test. So if you're using an inherited class to define your driver, or you set a process at the beginning, you know, maybe you're using a unit framework, right? And you have a process defined in your startup method, right? You would have test stuff just attached to that process as long as perhaps this is the variable name you use, right? So that's a nice way to just use your existing driver and reduce some of that code that you may uh, put in your, in, your, in your application. And then, right, I can also perhaps work from the main form page as well. And then I can tell us what is that process name, right? So use some, use some options there. You can also do a single property per line or single find call per line, just in terms of formatting. So you can go ahead and, you know, choose what your code looks like as well. So just some options I want to point out there that, you know, that instance or in identification of the object you play with can have a couple of different forms. Now, Let's say that I'm writing my code, and this is great, I'm saving some time, I'm building out my instances this way, but uh, this is still a lot of extra code, right? I don't wanna have to have this giant block of code every time I'm referencing a text box, right? That's certainly not gonna be ideal, again, from that readability and maintainability standpoint of my testing. And so, what I can do is actually generate an entire application object model, page object model in Java or C Sharp or VB, with a couple of clicks from my UI spot. So I don't have to even write this out all the time. I can actually create automatically a bunch of classes and methods that allow me to refer to my objects in an object oriented and a keyword type of style. So let me delete this. Let's create this object model, right? So go back to my UI spy here and we'll go ahead and pick an object. All right, so we'll just pick, I'm just trying to pick the browser here. And uh, looks like we have a, so I have to restart test slot because it looks like this instant froze, but Zoom meetings have been a little finicky with that. So it does slow some stuff down. Not a problem though, because I can just launch it again. And again, all right, what's going on? Search for the object. All right, we'll let this warm up for a second, but essentially what I want to do is I'm gonna go ahead and find the parent process of my entire application. And in a similar manner how to create identification, I'm gonna go ahead and search and create 
an entire object model. Now, just gonna speed this up a little bit. This was, there's some competing processes in my machine I needed to get rid of. Um, apologies there. Let me just select my page again. All right, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go to the parent process, that browser Firefox process. Notice I have all my three tabs of my application open. So this is, I think, a little important to note. For your web application or desktop application, make sure you have all elements of it open, all of it open under a parent process. In this case, my browser, Firefox, my parent process. Right click that process, and now you're gonna copy the model, as you can see right here, right? What that's gonna do, and I would put this into a class, a new class file, the right click paste or control V. Ah, oh, come on. <laughs> That was very anticlimactic. Uh, let me try it again. Copy the model. There it is. All right. We just built out 500 lines of code. To describe my entire application under test. So that's pretty cool. Again, the way I did that, to be clear, go to parent process in, to, in the test of UI spy of my application. Right click, copy the model, paste the model. That's it. Um, let's take a look at this model now, right? This is quite long. So imagine writing this from scratch, right? We're, we're kind of giving you a lot of time savings this way. And that was the other thing I was talking about in the beginning, right? Some people devote a lot of time in building out a model to make test maintenance and creation easier down the line. It's a very admirable effort, but again, even that can be time consuming to a fault. Whereas here, we're going to make that easy for you, right? And think of this as like a means to a start. We're giving you a model in code, right? You can go ahead and rename the mod, the, the classes. You can recomment stuff. You can reorganize it, reindent, right? You're free to refactor this in any other way you want. We're giving you a lot of the work for you up front. Now, let me actually show you the model I edited and talk a little bit more about that. So I'm going to delete this guy. And let me get to this model that I built. So this is the same thing. Basically, I just renamed some of the classes to fit my application a little better for me, right? And so now the idea of the model was what I said in the beginning. Instead of having 15 lines of code to generate my text box and then I set text on it, right? I can just call this method in object-oriented fashion and get my same exact statement, right, of setting text in one line of code. As I said earlier, just like that identification, I can edit these methods. Again, if, if my object ID is, is dynamic and I'm working with a dynamic web framework, I can wildcard that with a star and say, okay, take any object ID that fits this format. And I could use natural language expressions as well and make this flexible. And also again, add other identifiers that we pull from the UI spy directly to these methods for to make them even more unique, All right? So we're giving you the model, you're free to make it more robust as you'd like. And then if you, know, you had a lot of wholesale changes to your model, just go back to UI spy and regenerate, right? And then we'll control find, control replace can easily help you replace your old identifications or, or references with new ones. Um, quick question from Venkatesh here before I continue. How can we spy mouse over action web elements and catch type verification? Not so sure about that second one. Um, mouse over action web elements. Um, so that would be with a hover action, Venkatesh. So what you want to do is, uh, let's see. What you can do with test stuff UI spy is you can either do pick object, like click and hold, or you do point and fix. So with the point and fix, you would select that at, at that option. You'd hover over your mouse over action. Let's say you drop that one, come down, and then you would do the shift click and then it would select that object. So that's how I would do that. All right, good question. So moving on here with the model, right? I can, I can format this, I can edit it any way I like. And what's cool about the model is that it's entirely browser agnostic. Uh, meaning that I can record it for web testing at least on Firefox and then instantiate it on Chrome, right? Just like our test complete product. And desktop, obviously, you don't have to deal with that kind of stuff. But in general, your application will have a parent class with a nice constructor method here, allowing you to, let's say, define you know, what you want initialized. And this is cool because we'll give you the class, but you're free to build you know, your own copy constructor here and you know, maybe instantiate it differently. So one way I've seen users do that is if they have a different URL for production than they do for test. So instead of like changing the code, they'll just have two methods that they'll call 
they'll instantiate the model a little bit differently if they want a different URL to be used, right? Uh, so on and so forth. And as, I, as you can see here, right, this constructor takes in an argument of type browser. So that's allowing us to instantiate this any browser we want. And that's what I go ahead and do. Uh, we have our other pages here, our login page, do order page, orders page as well, right? And then maybe viewing all orders, that link. We have that all nicely packaged underneath the web orders app model. So when I instantiate this, I can use object-oriented programming practices to build code that is shorter, cleaner, and more readable, and then from there, easier to maintain as well, right? So as you can see, here's my orders application. It's instantiated with its uh, uh, constructor method. We're feeding it a browser type Firefox and URL. And specifically, um, the driver method has like a nice get applications run browser. So that's what I would do for your web tests uh, specifically. You don't have to use this specific method path if you don't want to. There are other ways to launch a browser. Um, from there though, as you can see the object model that we give you, or let's say the object model in general, it's gonna make test case writing a little bit easier, right? Uh, because you can use IntelliSense coding, uh, an ID will provide you to easily fill in the blanks for an object you need, right? I start off with my orders application, I get the login page, uh, then I get the username method, and then I set text on a username object that's returned. All in easy one-line code uh, or one-line, uh, yeah, one-line text, right? Allow me to do multiple actions at once. And so this resembles more of that keyword testing format, right? And ideally, developers want to build code like this. You know, they, they don't want to script uh, large brittle test cases. You know, they they want to be modular. They want to write object-oriented code. Uh, they want to write in Java and C sharp, right? So but they don't want to say spend the time and also building a whole entire application model out to do that, right? And that's where you see scripting come in and you see these more brittle tests being built. But because we can give you this application model uh, in an easily digestible and editable format right out the box, you can get to writing the tests the way you want to write them faster, right? That's going to get, again, the name of the game is speed here, right? So you're going to save time there. And then think about it, right? This model is your single point of maintenance for all of its use for all test cases associated with it, right? And then at a higher level, right, each of these methods are your single point of maintenance for all of your BDD scripts, if we bring it back to Gherkin, right? So we're giving you multiple layers of modularity here, allowing you to, when you have to debug and fix stuff, right, you have these nice small compartments saying, oh, the problem is localized to this small area, right? Versus trying to find, uh, you know, fix your error and not create more errors in a giant longer script. Right? So we're also kind of advocating for being modular in your, in your test creation practices and, and, you know, for your own sake, right, to help it uh, make it easier for you to debug this down a lot. And so finally, if you have code that are in these nice bite-sized, editable, easy to reuse chunks, and your code is readable as well, right, not only from a low level, oh, developers can easily catch on what's happening, but you know, even a BA can see what's happening as well with the Gherkin statement. But you're creating, so you're creating, re, if you're creating, modular components to build your test cases up and they're readable and therefore reusable, that's a recipe for creating a more maintainable testing architecture down the line. Which I think the final big benefit of what test labs can do for your firm and your team, right? We're, we're advocating for these processes in a micro, right? Of being iterative, of, of being modular. And then that's gonna inform your processes in the macro as well, we believe, right? So it's a great way to kind of get started in that shift left movement. Now, that's how I built my entire test case out, right? Instantiate my application. And for each Gherkin statement, I made sure I go ahead and fill out exactly what needs to be done. Uh, and that's it. And the nice thing is I can have as many different feature files call from the same implementation file. Obviously they're different ones, right? So I have, you know, all my steps here for all these feature, three feature files. So again, they're running from the same code base. If I, one of these feature files breaks or fails, I go to one place to edit, right? Reducing place I have to look for my bugs, right? Saving that time. All right, so we get to the end here. I wanna speak a little bit about executing this, and then when I execute this, I wanna talk a little bit about uh, perhaps hip tests and answer any questions about test slots. Because I know that this is a newer product that we have, or at least we're kind of rebirthing it, so definitely want to be able to answer any questions people may have. But quickly, as I uh, wait for your uh, Q&A, uh, let's see. So I can run this test case in a number of different ways. I can execute it from the IDE directly. I can run the Gherkin files individually. I can use command line, right? Do a little Maven test command and run 
uh, run that command wherever my POM XML file is. A lot of different ways. You see, in testnet in general, even as to why we picked BDD in the first place, really before we realized, oh, this has real value here in the shelf of story, was to say that Tesla can be used in any kind of development or testing framework you like, right? At the end of the day, it's just code. It's really a, a direct replacement of Selenium if you think about it, right? And if you're writing Selenium today, you don't have to change around your processes. You just have to, this will, all this will do is make your processes easier and quicker. You're still writing code in the way you know how to write code. Right, so but it can embed itself into, you know, you can use test left uh, for your test cases in a CI process or continuous testing framework, right? You could use it in BDD or ATDD, TDD, things like that. So again, just another point that test left is flexible. And finally, right, we're allowing you to use your ID or source code editor of your choice. So there's no bulky, you know, UI or hardware around this, right? Again, and developers generally like that. They want to get involved in something that is of minimal effort to them only something that's going to help them. So I certainly believe that this stripped down version of test complete can serve that purpose. So let's go ahead and run this. And while I'm running this, uh, let's rebuild it. All right, give me one second and I'll rebuild my solution. I hope that you guys got a good idea of what Tesla can do for you. And I think, you know, definitely talk a little bit about value, but I think the, the operation itself is pretty lightweight, right? There's not a lot to the tool. The UI spy is the real main piece of functionality. Then from there, if you know how to code it, you can do it, right? Uh, so let's see, there we go. Let's run our tests. Um, so the BDD aspect specifically, not to keep harping on that, that's just something that we felt was a good way for teams to embrace, not only using test stuff, but shifting left as well, right? Because again, it's not so much that you could definitely use it in a solid environment still, and that could work, right? As just pure testing, but the idea is to more say, okay, I'm getting my developers involved, but then they're also going to be in the same page, be more iteratively building unit tests with my QA team in mind or in conjunction with them. So that's what BDD can kind of do, kind of uh, bridge that process together. I'm not so sure why this is not running, but uh, what's going on here? Real quick, I'm just going to activate the the poll um, while you know while we're coming down in the last few minutes here of, of the training. Um, if you guys can just give us a quick um, one to five rating on how you feel the training went today, um, it's super helpful for us to be able to um, just know how effective this this is. And you know, moving forward, if you have any ideas for any other topics you feel would be helpful, um, definitely you know send us an email. Like I said, at customers at smartbear.com. Um, we are more than happy to, um, you know, to, to follow up and, and to have that conversation with you. Um, and, and again, as we come down to these last few minutes, continue to send any, any other questions in um, that you might have for prom. All right. In the meantime, we're getting some from uh, uh, Chandra Reddy again. Is Tesla going to integrate with cross-browser testing? Certainly a good question. Um, so I'm not sure... So I know, so Tesla has a remote web driver and I believe some of the machines in cross browser testing uh, on in their site in Memphis do have our tests execute on them because we did have prior integration with test complete and cross browser testing we tried to push out. So what I recommend doing is if you are actually interested in that, if you're a current customer, let your customer success manager know. And if not, do get in touch with us and we can get that question answered for you because I don't know if I know the answer to that concretely but people in product definitely do. And if that's the case, then we can definitely, you know, produce it, help you get set up. I was working with that. Now I will say that if, if that was the case, it did work. Test stuff is windows only, right? It's a, it's a thick client windows product. So it's only gonna work with windows based operating systems, browsers and configurations. Just do, just do keep that in mind. All right, there it is. And uh, if you use an open source tool like Cucumber or Specflow, they'll give you some nice BDD based reporting back. They'll show you the you know, amount of time each statement took, its pass fail result, and then you know, a code piece associated with it as well. Test stuff also generates some reporting similar to what Test Complete generates. So we have an API that's associated with Test Left. You can use it to add uh, you know, screenshots, um, uh, comments, things like that, data to a log file. And you can save that log file in any location you want. Uh, if you use test complete, it's the same exact log file as test complete. So that's pretty handy. A little more information a developer can use. As you can see, it's running through my three uh, data-driven, uh, my three, sorry, uh, 
Perkins scenarios right now. Just added an order. Now it's going to delete an order and just like any automated software, it's running through this relatively rapidly. So, uh, just so everyone is on the same page. But all right, I think uh, that brings us to a close I, for the most part um, as this finishes running. I want to thank you guys for attending. Uh,